Thank you for joining us for Bay Area Older Adults Anderson Lake Waterways Program in partnership with Valley Water. My name is Dr. Nusrat Khalili, and this is a Bay Area Older Adults Lecture. Bay Area Older Adults, or BAO for short, is a nonprofit organization that improves the health and well being of 42,000 adults age 50 plus each year. We trek on nature trails, learn about different cultures, explore historic sites, experience new culinary flavors, and help connect you to people with shared interests. Since 2013, we have taken more than 4,600 seniors who have walked almost 14,000 miles in more than 35 parks. Photos from some of our walks are shown here, along with our website address. How many people have and have not been to Anderson Lake County Park? For those of you who have not been there before, the main park entrance where the visitor center is located at 19245 Malaguerra Avenue in Morgan Hill. You would get there by taking Highway 101 South and exiting at Cochrane Road to head east for about one mile. Then turn left on Mar Malaguerra Avenue. This road ends at a parking lot adjacent to the visitor center. There are two large parking lots, so it is unlikely they will both be full. There are restrooms near the parking lot, and when the visitor center is open, there are restrooms there too. Now, before we start talking about Anderson Lake County Park, let's talk about climate change. First, let's define climate. Climate refers to the long-term global average of temperature, humidity, and rainfall patterns. This could be over seasons, years, or decades. This is in comparison to weather, which refers to local and short-term atmospheric conditions, which can be from minutes to hours or days. Some things you may think about when you think about climate change are increased frequency and extent of California wildfires, flooding on the East Coast, or drought in Africa. So if climate refers to long-term global average of temperature, humidity, and rainfall patterns, climate resilience is the ability to anticipate, prepare for, and respond to hazardous events, trends, or disturbances related to climate. Now I'm going to share a story about climate resilience and the native Alaskan tribes. The Alaskan tribes and villages plan for future generations in decision making by focusing on the seventh generation principle. When you sit and you counsel for the welfare of the people, think not of yourself, nor of your family, nor even your generation. Make your decisions on behalf of the seventh generation coming. If a generation is considered about 25 years, this means projecting potential risks and side effects of your actions 175 years into the future. This is a great way to plan for climate change. There is a traditional uh, native Alaskan community that lives near the Arctic Ocean in the northwest region of Alaska. Their land is mainly permafrost, a thick subsurface layer of soil that remains frozen throughout the year, and ice. They are adapted to the cold, frozen environment, but temperatures are warming, the land is thawing, and the ice is melting. 
This has affected their food supply that includes caribou, seal, whales, and other meat they have worked hard to hunt for. They store their food deep underground in cellars to keep it cold even in the summer so that they can eat it over time. The cellars have warmed and the meat has become rotten and the mold moldy and unusable, leading to food shortages and foodborne illnesses. This is compounded by the fact that animals have grown more scarce because their habitat is shrinking and it is harder to hunt on melting sea ice and flooded land. So how have the native Alaskans adapted to this changing climate? Well, they have made improvements to the ice cellars. Specifically, they've added a hut on top of the ice cellar, which has a roof with solar panels that powers an energy efficient thermostat controlled cooling system. This is one way this community has adapted to climate change to become climate resilient. How have we in California become climate resilient? For example, we may have removed lawns and replaced with native plants due to ongoing drought, cut back trees <clears throat> and foliage around homes to prevent fire damage. Now, Anderson Lake County Park has a dam that will begin undergoing a seismic retrofit this year. This project is a local example of climate change and climate resilience, and I will explain why shortly. Question for you, have you heard about the details of the seismic retrofit project for Anderson Lake Dam by, led by Valley Water? Anderson Lake County Parks Dam creates the county's largest surface water reservoir, Anderson Reservoir, which stores local rainfall runoff. Water from the reservoir is released in a consistent flow into the downstream Coyote Creek for native fish, amphibians, reptiles, and to maintain the wetlands and riparian habitats for other wildlife. The reservoir is also an important source of water treatment plants and recharging of the groundwater basin that feeds humans' water supply. Climate change in the Bay Area and California in general has led to increasing temperatures. This leads to increased evaporation of water from the Pacific Ocean which leads to an increased atmospheric rivers, which are essentially rivers of water vapor in the sky. Atmospheric rivers store water and the warmer it is, the more they store. This leads to more severe storms in the winter, increased probability that the reservoir overflows and runs into Coyote Creek which also overflows. A study published last year by UCLA scientists found that climate change related increase in temperatures will increase California's average winter precipitation by 25%. And most of it will be in the form of rainfall, not snowfall. This is expected to overwhelm our reservoirs that catch the rainfall and this would cause flooding. Does everyone remember the 2017 flooding of Coyote Creek? The flooding occurred when Anderson Reservoir filled up to the top during a severe rainstorm. Water poured over its spillway and ran into Coyote Creek, one of the main waterways that runs through San Jose, which then filled up and surged over its banks. This flood caused 100 million in damage and forced the emergency evacuation of 14,000 people. 
most of them residents of neighborhoods in and around downtown San Jose. It had been determined by scientists many years ago that a large earthquake could damage Anderson Dam, causing failure and an uncontrolled release of water into Coyote Creek. The flooding waters would head north to San Francisco Bay and west to Monterey Bay, and in its path, flooding a lot of Silicon Valley's land area. This was why the reservoir was limited to only 58% of its capacity. This is unfortunate for two reasons. It reduces Santa Clara County's drinking water resources, and it increases chance of flooding due to climate change. The seismic retrofit project is a huge remodel of the dam and its related parts. First, during the project, a new and larger outlet pipe will be designed and built on the bottom of the dam. This pipe will allow more control over water levels to increase public safety. They will build a new outlet on the top of the dam for emergency drainage. They will replace the embankment materials that create the wall structure with those that won't liquefy during an earthquake. Last but not least, they will increase the height of the concrete spillway and top of the dam to allow storage of more water to prevent flooding. The dam retrofit is an example of adapting to earthquakes and also to climate change or climate resilience because it will allow the dam to hold more water from winter storms and in the hopes of preventing floods. Anderson Reservoir is officially closed for boating and fishing and some picnic and parking areas are closed for at least 10 years while the new dam is being built. Now that we learned a little about climate change, climate resilience, and the Anderson Dam Retrofit Project, I'm going to ask you a few questions. The first question is, what is an example of climate change? The choices are increased frequency of flooding in New Orleans, increased frequency and size of fires in California, increased drought in parts of Africa, or all the above. You're right, all of the above. Now the next question is, how is the Anderson Dam Seismic Retrofit Project helping our county become climate resilience? The choices are it allows more fishing to feed more residents. The new dam will hold more water to prevent flooding. The extra outlet pipe will increase flooding. Or none of the above. The correct answer is the new dam will hold more water to prevent flooding. Now, let's start our Anderson Lake Waterways tour. Today we're going to take a leisurely two-mile walk along the longest creek in Santa Clara County, which runs through Anderson Lake County Park. We will learn about the trees, aromatic plants, birds, and mammals that depend on this water source. Along the way, we find historic structures still remaining on this property. Let's start our waterways tour. Anderson Lake County Park is home to the largest human-made reservoir in Santa Clara County and is seven miles long and 1,250 acres of surface area. The park is more than 4,200 acres of mostly flat land with wide paved trails and some narrower dirt trails that are used by pedestrians, cyclists, and equestrians. We begin our journey at the trailhead near Anderson Lake Visitor Center. The trail is narrow and within 100 feet it leads us to Coyote Creek. This is the longest creek in Santa Clara County, flowing north for more than 60 miles, 
through Coyote and Anderson Reservoirs, San Jose, Milpitas, and finally into San Francisco Bay. All of the trails in this county park are never far from Coyote Creek. The creek provides habitat for waterfowl, such as great blue heron, wood and mallard ducks, and belted kingfishers. Belted kingfishers are stocky, large-headed birds with a shaggy head of feathers and a thick dagger-like bill. Females are blue-gray with a rust-colored band on their belly and flanks. Their legs are short and their tails are medium length and square tipped. They spend a lot of time perched along the edges of creeks and lakes searching for small fish. The creek also provides a habitat that supports many types of trees, such as western sycamore, valley oak, red willow, and coast live oak. Coast live oak is an evergreen tree that grows up to 100 feet tall with many large crooked branches. They can reach 250 years old with trunk diameters of up to 12 feet. Their acorns are an important food source for birds and animals. Coast live oak leaves are dark green, thick, and leathery. Their edges have spiny teeth. The leaves have two layers of photosynthetic cells to maximize sun absorption. The trees we pass along the creek make comfortable nesting spots for a variety of birds. We find an oak titmouse looking for food on the coast live oak. They are small, gray-brown songbird with a short stubby bill, a short crest on its head, and a medium long tail. Next we hear the song of a white-breasted nuthatch and see it quickly creeping around and upside down on a large branch of a coast live oak tree. This small bird has a relatively large head. As their name suggests, they have a frosty white breast, neck and face, with a gray-blue back and black cap. The underside of their tail is rust-colored. They have a habit of jamming large nuts and acorns into tree bark, then whacking them with their sharp bill to release the seed. We walk further along the narrow dirt trail to find more spots to view the creek. There are tall grasses on either side of the path and bushes and trees further from the trail. We can hear the sound of songbirds. We walk over a reddish-brown wood bridge that crosses Coyote Creek. A golden-crowned sparrow jumps along the bridge's handrail. These large sparrows have a small gray bill and face, black cap, and breeding adult males have a bright yellow crown. After the bridge, we turn left onto a path that leads to a walnut tree orchard. 
Walnuts are fast-growing trees that develop broad canopies and demand a lot of sunshine. The trees can self-fertilize because they have both male and female flower parts on the same tree. Walnuts produce a growth inhibitor called juglone that inhibits the growth of some plant species that grow close to the tree. Some of the pests that the tree has to protect itself against include the codling moth, navel orange worm, walnut husk fly, aphids, scales, mites, and nematodes. To the right of the bridge is a damaged chicken housing structure from the 1920s that could fit tens of thousands of chickens. In the early 1900s, chickens were primarily raised on family farms where a flock of 400 birds was considered large. Families with larger flocks sold eggs as their primary source of income, and chicken meat was a delicacy that was reserved for special occasions. The broiler industry began in the 1920s. This was when thousands of chickens were confined to housing like this old one along the Coyote Creek Trail, and they were eaten more often as meat. Behind the chicken house is the oldest Santa Clara County winery, Malaguerra Winery. The two-story structure was built for Jose Malaguerra in 1869. It was made of basalt rubble stone taken from the nearby Coyote Creek. At this time, Malaguerra was one of 26 vintners in Santa Clara County. Except for a break during a period of grape overproduction during the turn of the century, Malaguerra Winery remained in operation until 1950. We head back to the bridge to roam around the meadow where there are rows of orchard trees and coast live oak. There are all kinds of birds singing and jumping around in the trees. There are rows and rows of blooming trees that have pale pink and white flowers whose petals are notched. We can also see many fuzzy shells hanging from the branches. They are almond trees and their shells won't split open until July. During the fall harvest, mechanical tree shakers are used to vigorously shake the tree and the almonds fall to the ground. There is a chorus of sounds coming from the trees. We spot a mourning dove sitting on one of the branches. It has tan wings with black spots and a slender tan tail and small bill. Its head looks small compared to its body. At the very top of a coast live oak tree are two white-crowned sparrows. Its yellow bill contrasts with the bold black and white stripes on its head. The two birds seem to be surveying the meadow while they relax on the tips of branches. On a thin branch of another tree, there is a female Anna's hummingbird. She has an emerald colored cap and wings and the rest of her body is gray. These are among the most common hummingbirds along the Pacific coast. Male hummingbirds have more iridescent green feathers on their body and sparkling pink throats. We are lucky to catch a glimpse of a spotted towhee. It has striking bright orange rust colored flanks and eyes that contrast sharply with its black head, tail and wings that have white on their tips. During the mating season, males have been recorded spending up to 90% of their mornings singing to attract a mate. It's amazing how many birds are in the trees. Hidden in the branches of another tree is a small bird walking up and around a medium-sized branch, climbing to the top of the tree. It has a bright red cap, a chisel-shaped bill, and its face, wings, and body have black and white stripes. This area is the perfect habitat for this nuttall woodpecker because they live in oak woodlands and like to be near creeks with cottonwoods, willows, and sycamores, all trees found here at the park. Just like most other woodpeckers, they have four toes arranged in an X pattern with two set forward and the other two backward, which allows them to cling to vertical surfaces more easily. 
The grassy meadow is a place to find other types of birds that look for nuts and seeds on the ground. We spot a California scrub jay hopping along the ground with an almond shell in its mouth. While these birds and their calls are common in California, they have beautiful deep azure blue wings, tail and cap, with a light gray stripe on its back and soft white underside and white brow. These birds have a reputation for being mischievous. As an example, they are known for stealing acorns from acorn woodpecker caches. Another bird we find foraging on the ground for seeds is the California towhee that is a light gray bird all over. Unlike humans who want to stay away from poison oak, these birds frequently build their nests in poison oak and eat their berries. In addition to trees and birds, there are many types of mammals that make their home by Coyote Creek. We can find traces of these animals from their tracks. These animals include gray foxes that are small, weigh up to 15 pounds, are omnivores, and have the unique ability to climb trees, so they've been nicknamed tree fox. They are nocturnal, so it's unlikely to see them at the park. There are bobcats, mule deer, and wild boar, another nocturnal omnivore that was introduced from Europe in the 1500s. There are opossums, cottontail rabbits, and black-tailed jackrabbits that are easily identified by their long black-tipped ears and gray-brown body and long, strong hind legs that can get them to speeds up to 40 miles per hour and jumping up to 19 feet high to escape predators such as coyotes, red-tailed hawks, great horned owls, and bobcats. Last but not least, there are fragrant plants that grow along Coyote Creek. For example, pearly everlasting. If you rub some of its flowers between your fingers, it will emit the odor of maple syrup and leave a sticky substance on your fingers. Alkali heliotrope is a perennial herb whose stem uncoils as it blooms tiny white flowers, some with yellow and some with purple throats. It has aromas of cherries, almonds, and vanilla. Another plant found in this habitat is white whorehound, a bushy plant with unique woolly and crinkled leaves and white flowers. If you crush the leaves in your hand, you will note a bitter smell. It is safe to taste it as it's been used as an herbal remedy for thousands of years. I want to thank uh, Valley Water for supporting this virtual program. We have one last question for you. Please rate your satisfaction with today's program on a scale from very satisfied to very unsatisfied. Next, I want to remind you that this presentation and our other park tours are available at BAO's webpage, 
www.bayareaolderadults.org front slash videos. If you know anyone else who would appreciate this video, please, please feel free to share this link with them. Thank you for joining us, and we hope to see you at our uh, future virtual and in-person programs. Thank you.